All right, welcome. This is Andrew Ains with Apex Pro, and we're here today to discuss Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course. Uh, so I decided to bring in a resident expert. So we got Anthony Magnoli on the uh, on the other end of the video call here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Anthony. Hey, Andrew. Uh, nice to be with you today. Uh, my name is Anthony Magnoli of uh, Drive Faster Now. Um, I've spent a few laps around Mid-Ohio. Um, so I do a lot of professional driver coaching, uh, everyone from kind of intermediate advanced level up through uh, pro level drivers. Um, also vehicle dynamics engineer and do a lot of uh, race car setup as well. Um, I ran Spec E30 for a number of years and um, hold the track records on the pro and uh, club courses of Mid-Ohio. Um, so got pretty good uh, reference, I think, to uh, to go from or to work from for, uh, for our little exercise today. Awesome. Yeah, so we're going to be looking at Anthony's track record uh, lap in the Spec E30, and then we've also got some Apex Pro data, um, courtesy of Mike Cooper um, in the Spec 944. So slightly different car, but pretty similar lap time. And um, we've you know spent some time looking at it, and I think they support each other really well. So we'll be kind of using those as our references, and I'm really going to let Anthony kind of guide the conversation because he's he knows every inch of the track. But we'll we'll start with turn one, and um, Anthony, I'll, I'll let you kind of take it over. But as as you approach term one, you know, what are you thinking about? What are you focused on? Okay. Um, you know, as we go through here, I might also pipe in with uh, some things to note that may be relevant to a quicker car than, than this. But um, in general, uh, the, the track features that um, affect a spec E30 are there for a more powerful car. And there might be just some slight uh, modifications to the line. But um, in general, those track features are actually Kind of more impactful to a uh, to a more powerful car, so uh, this should all apply um, pretty well throughout the throughout the uh, range of cars. Awesome. So as we approach turn one, uh, turn one is a fast uh, left hand turn, and what you'll find with turn one, as well as a couple others, is that um, there are pairs of turns around Mid Ohio that are very similar to each other. So turn one is very similar in approach and execution as what I refer to as, as turn 14, um, different uh, numbering structures may, uh, may call it something else, but basically the fast left after the red wall and before mm -hmm. the carousel. So um, as we're approaching, this is going to be um, a light braking zone um, and, and a fast entry. You do have a bit of a bump on entry that you'll need to manage. Um, but as we, as we come in, we'll talk about the, uh, the references for, for our braking points. In, in a Spec E30, the braking is... Um, very nearly, uh, I mean, just before the turn-in point because such a short uh, break zone. Um, but it'll be, it might be the 100-foot mark or so. So I'll let you um, come up to the uh, to the turn-in point, and which we'll be looking at the the abutment on the bridge or kind of the the base of the bridge to the right, um, at, and at the end of the white wall. Um, it's not really where your eyes are going to be looking, but it's a good periphery. Yeah, exactly. There's a good periphery reference for where you would want your turn in to be. Okay. I'll go ahead and play the video forward to that point and stop around the, around the uh, turn in. Okay. Somewhere around right here. Yeah. So you can actually see the corner worker station sitting there and there's a black spot. Um, yep. So that, that's a good place um, for the car to be. Uh, turning into the into the turn from and and um, you can't see it yet but there's there's a long red and white curb um, that separates the the racing surface from the track out um, you can consider that whole curb kind of the apex but you definitely want especially in a slower car to be targeting the uh, the beginning of that curb as your apex point in a faster car uh, you may utilize the end of that curving as your apex point um, just to get to straighten out your exit a little bit more if you're if you're trying to uh, apply you know a whole lot more power than maybe a couple hundred horsepower. Right, in a traction limited car where you've got more power than grip as opposed to a, a non-traction limited car, I guess. <laughs> yeah, or it's just all about that power to grip ratio. I yeah. So, um, so turn one is all about long, slow hands. Um, so you're going to be feeding steering input all the way from the turn in point, that initial turn in point all the way to um, the, the curb, the apex curbing. Um, I did mention that there's a bit of a dip on the way in. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's also part of the importance is that you, know, you can't be fully loaded yet as you, as you get through that. Um, and you'll see in this video, 
there's going to be the car is going to have a little bit more yaw than uh, than normal. Um, so you won't be following my my steering angle um, exactly, but um, you'll see kind of the guide all the way into the apex. Gotcha. We'll go ahead and play through the corner then. Go ahead. Yeah. I'll stop. It's the beginning of the curb, and then let it come out and use all of that track out all the way onto that yellow curb. Um, a good training tool for yourself is to uh, drive the car onto the yellow curb and feel the dip at the end of it. Um, that's how you know that you've utilized all the uh, available uh, track out room. And by doing that consistently, then you'll recognize when you could have gotten on the gas a little bit sooner mm -hmm. and help, you know, train yourself to do that. Yeah, make sure the car goes there naturally without you having to drive it there. Exactly. Yeah. At first, I I tell people to drive it there, right? And then you you'll fill in with speed, but you mm -hmm. won't you won't be guessing as to where the car is going um, as you do add speed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This uh, and we saw that kind of little moment mid corner, but it, um, and you and you know you mentioned that you got a little more rotation, but in the spec E30, your braking zone and any any you know, low horsepower car with a lot of grip, your braking zone is going to be so compressed that it's probably really easy to carry a little too much brake a little too late, which is going to cause that rear end to kind of be happy. Right. Whereas, yeah. you know, so the adjustment there that, that you could perceive, you know, perceivably make, even though that was really good and really quick hands, is like slightly earlier throttle application or a slightly sooner release of the brake. Right. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah. There? Is that yeah. Yeah. And I think in this case, it could have been, it was a combination of having just a touch more brake with a little bit more aggressive steering input. Um, that if that was if the steering input was slowed down just a little bit or the brake, brake release extended just a little bit, it mm -hmm. would have uh, better balanced the car. Um, but keep in mind, I'm using that that weight transfer on the nose to get the car to turn. Right. Um, if you, you know, most people I'm going to find are probably not um, effectively loading the nose or, or releasing a little bit too soon, if anything. Um, so this this might be just a touch past optimal. Yeah, in that particular case, but I don't uh, think it cost me anything really. No, I don't think so. It looked it looked it looked awesome, and it looked like a lot of fun. Do, do you see a lot of times in turn one because it is a pretty high speed entry? Do you see a lot of people that carry the brake pedal too long into into turn one, and they create too much rotation, and that makes the car feel unstable? Um, if if people scare themselves, I tend to see that. Um, but more often than not, I tend to see people over braking, simply over braking for the turn and, um, or turning in too late. So you do, the hardest thing about it is that it's a, it's a vague turn in. The, the turn in point that I referenced is off to your right when your eyes are going to your left. Um, yep. So it does, it does take some, um, uh, you know, some creation of, of mes muscle memory and, um, and managing that weight transfer over a long corner entry with a bit of a dip in the middle of it. Yeah, we'll, we'll run through it one more time in the video and then we'll move forward to the keyhole to just kind of reinforce what, what you were just talking about because this, you know, it is a fairly long corner. So you start turning in about right here. Initiation, yeah. A little bit of rotation. But look how you use all the track on the exit. I mean, all the way up to where, you know, you're probably three to six inches from the grass on the right side of the car. That's, that's beautiful. Um, and there's a dip right at the end of the yellow curb and uh you should you should hit that i mean feel it that you've used everything on the on the track out yeah right in right in here yep, dip. yep. gotcha well let's go down uh and talk about the keyhole a little bit that was, do you, that was awesome do you want to jump over to the data real quick and see what it looks like from uh yeah like cooper's data let's let's look at mike's data through there all right so we should have the data on the screen now we'll uh we'll take a look at term one so we've got his fastest lap selected and this this first uh, channel we have here is the Apex percentage, um, which if you're familiar with Apex Pro, that's basically just showing you what colors the lights were as you're going through there, what color they mostly were. Um, and this, this car is gonna have an extremely similar braking occurrence. Um, but to analyze braking, I always spend a lot of time with longitudinal G um, because it's you know the, the measure of the result of your braking and, and acceleration you know, in, the, in the longitudinal sense. Um, and you can see our turn in points you know, roughly in the same place. Um, and then also what Anthony was talking about here, this is our braking zone right here. This is our pretty compressed, um, about 0.6 to 0.7 negative G on your braking. So he's 
I don't think Mike's over breaking it all through here. I think he actually has a really, really good approach. If we go to the speed trace, um, oops, Let's see, I'm going to keep this one on longitudinal G. I'm going to go to the speed trace on the bottom, the bottom screen here. This is the uh, relatively new iPad um, app, which is slightly different, but this divot in the speed trace actually looks pretty good, right? Uh, Anthony's kind of got that. It bottoms out a little bit. It's not too abrupt. It's a more shallow speed trace instead of like a V, which would mean that, you know, like like the keyhole obviously right here is going to be a V shape. This is a little bit more of a U because it's a high speed corner. And his minimum corner speed's, you know, 75 miles an hour, a little over 75 miles per hour. Um, but is there anything you see in there that you want to flesh out anymore? Does that look pretty good? Um, yeah, the, you know, the approach looks good. His max braking is uh, is good. Um, 0.6. I think I was at 0.6 something um, for my max. Um, it it does look a little bit more V-shaped than than I what I see. I kind of end up, uh, be floating, um, right. be fighting the scrub, frankly, um, on the um, on the corner entry. So I'm um, yeah, and, and so my minimum is a little bit higher. Uh, my minimum is in the. Uh, 79 mile an hour range mm -hmm. um, came out with a little bit less tire I think we're similar weight or they might be a little bit heavier in the Porsches uh, uh, yeah. 2700 and a, and a spec 30 um, so uh, we could we could dig in with some uh, with some G sum uh, or or looking at in aim or in uh, apex pro terms um, your score, right? Yeah. As you as you go through, right. Um, and we, we've got this is what I always see on the entry to fast corners um, is the you know we're looking at light display down here. So what he was seeing in the car when he applied the brakes here, it's a good amount of red lights. So red represents uh, available traction, right? Available grip. So I think uh, what we're seeing on this, what well, could you and I kind of point to the same thing, but that sharp drop in the speed trace right here is caused by hard braking and this is probably that steeper kind of v-shape to the speed trace probably pinning a little too much weight on the nose for too long maybe or could have started to roll back to the power soon so i, I think there's probably a little bit of speed to be had by um slowing a little less would be the way yep. to, the way to, and and the what i really like to use the apex lights for is the macro analysis of going, okay, I, you know, we're at wide open throttle right now. We've got a lot of red lights. When we see the transition from all red to some green lights, that's what means that there's some underutilized grip. As he starts to add steering, we start to get closer to the limit of the tire. So where, the, where he really should be working to improve here is in the braking zone to create a little more balance. I think it, it, for that car, like you said, he's got a little more tire than you do. He might only need to be braking at 0.5, negative 0.5 or less, and the car would accept that amount of um, speed into the corner, whereas you're on a slightly different chassis, right? Yeah, yeah, in a momentum car, I mean, the, the braking to corner or to turn one is really to turn the car, not really to slow the car mm -hmm. uh, significantly. So yeah, you could, you could kind of charge the corner a little bit, a little bit uh, more quickly, as long as you can make it to the uh, beginning of that apex curb and get back in the gas um, nice and early there, uh, I think you'd find just, I mean, his exit is wonderful. Uh, he could probably just find, you know, a tenth or, or two um, just on the corner entry. Yeah, awesome. Well, well, we'll go ahead and move to the keyhole. I'll go back to the right. video. But, you know, in, in fast corners, too, uh, there's, always, there's always a little more time on the entry, right? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> It's always even even when you're at a at a really high level, it's like that's where all the time is, right? It's like halfway through the braking zone to the apex is kind of the is kind of where you're looking. So when we're on the straightaway here, you know, you just tracked out, got your hands straight, uh, exiting one. What are you thinking about, or where's your mind going to prepare for the keyhole? So uh, the keyhole's coming up and it's going to be turning right. So going back to the left side of the track, um, even from this view, you can see that that we're kind of going uphill and it's going to flatten and then you can see how steeply it goes uphill into the keyhole kind yeah. of right at the horizon there um, and we want to note that because that uh, that topography change is going to help with uh, braking 
going into the keyhole. So you're gonna have really good braking grip um, as you go in there. So we're gonna get the car transition back over to the left. And um, the keyhole itself is a double apex um, turn, very similar to the carousel. Uh, that first apex, you're really just braking past it. Um, and that apex point may not actually be on the curb, in fact, for most, for a lot of cars, it's kind of in the middle of the track, but there is an apex that you're breaking past um, mm. uh, there. Gotcha. So, somewhere to now we, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so as we, as we break here, um, I'm gonna get the car pivoted to break across the track from the left side to basically mid-track or just slightly right of mid-track. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say maybe you know, left side tires at mid-track. Um, actually doing the braking across the track um, to shorten the distance and then um, not have to turn the car uh, as hard of an angle on the on the corner entry. Um, so you can brake nice and late here. Um, we kind of just went past our braking points, our braking markers, um, our reference markers on the left side. Um, they're typically set out with cones of one cone for, uh, it goes usually a three, two, one, um, or a four, three, two, one, uh, depending on the braking zone. So you can see them lined up there on the left. Right there. And, oh, yeah, the, cor the cones that are, um, actually track side are, um, are typically more easy to see until somebody wipes them out at least. <laughs> uh, so referencing those, um, you know, you can break a little bit later than, than you think in a car like ours, I think we're about one, the one fifty point, you know, halfway between the one and the two. Um, but yeah, you've got a lot of grip on entry. Just, uh, just get the car pivoted, uh, across the track right before you hit the brakes. Um, so that you're breaking at a trajectory across the track um, from the left side to the middle. Seems to me like that's really the the key uh, to this entry to the keyhole, right? Because it, if you just look at it from purely a, um, a, you know, there's a lot of different ways you could interpret this corner, but some people might want to stay track left and kind of try to open up the exit by just getting one sweeping late apex. But because of the topography here, and all the other things going on, it really benefits you to start that kind of cross track turn, which I think is yep. is, is super um, is super interesting. You want me to just play through this here? And yeah, let me let me just say by by treating it like a double apex, um, it shortens your time at minimum speed. Mm. That's basically, what it does, or or shortens your time at maintenance throttle um, by by kind of using the entry part of the corner to continue your deceleration to your final mm. mid corner min corner speed. That's, yeah, it makes a ton of sense. So go through here, there's gonna be a drop off here. Now we're climbing the hill, but then it's gonna drop off and you need to time this drop off with a throttle lift to recover that grip. Mm -hmm. And um, a, that lift is gonna help plant the nose. You feed some steering input. You know, we're, we're kind of at uh, maintenance throttle here in the middle of the turn where we're at right now. As we, as we come past this drop, we're gonna lift, get the nose to tuck, and aim us to our apex point, which is about three or four blocks of the red and white blocks from the end. And once we're aimed there, and we know we're gonna go there, you can roll to full throttle. Pretty much any car, as long as you're aimed to your apex point, you can roll to full throttle um, from that point. So this is about where you're kind of starting to coordinate that, that lift to gain a little bit of front end grip, right? Yep. Yep, so it's kind of a lift, turn, go type of situation. Um, the timing will be based on the, uh, the rate of weight transfer in your vehicle um, and steering response in your vehicle and the amount of power that it has. But um, typically it's, it's you know, that, that lift with a, a turn that might be a little bit, steering, a little bit of additional steering input um, to get you pointed. And as soon as you're pointed from that point, you should be able to roll to full throttle. Gotcha. We'll go ahead and play through it here. And, and okay. since we kind of went through here uh, in little chunks, I'll go back and, and replay it so we can kind of see the smooth progression. But there you go. You can see the, you know, you, first of all, you're all over the curb over here. You can see all this pavement change that's going on as well mm -hmm. and how steeply the track just drops downhill, which is which has got to be the challenge to this area, right? I mean, that's just nothing easy about it. And if you roll through the video, a lot of times what you hear is people or, or what you see and hear and people commit to power too early because it's kind of a patience. It's a, it's a scenario where you've, you kind of have to let the car get the grip and, and not fight against it, right? So mm -hmm. I love what you're saying because it's really kind of working with the, the track 
um, to accomplish what you're trying to do. But I'll go back and play through the whole um, sequence and then we can go yeah. into I'll say the throttle application kind of defines the driver's personality. You know, drivers that are a little bit tentative and working up to the limit are gonna be a little bit late getting the throttle. Drivers who are very aggressive are, are likely gonna be too soon to throttle, especially you know, with a little bit of red mist in a uh, race mm -hmm. situation. Um, but you get that timing right and you get the feel for it right. As long as you know you're pointed to full throttle, or sorry, pointed to the apex point, you can roll to full throttle from there and you shouldn't have to lift again before corner exit. That's super valuable self-analysis because that's that, that one tendency that you have, you can kind of binarily choose, do I do this or do I do that? Do I commit too early or do I, am I tentative and commit too late? And that is kind of the voice that's kind of the mindset you have to approach it or know the self-awareness you have to have to find speed. So that's, that's, uh, that's worth, worth money right there. <laughs> Brake release at the crest, floating lift back on the gas, about four car, four blocks from the end is the apex point and then using all that track out right up onto the yellow curve. And this is totally great. the most, uh, valuable and important, uh, corner on the track because it leads on to the back straight. Uh, we're going through the kink here, uh, which is a non-event in the dry. It may be an event in, it may be a real turn in the, in the wet. Mm -hmm. um, so keep that in mind. Um, actually, you know, Mid-Ohio is a whole nother animal in the wet. Maybe we'll, we'll, you know, touch on that at the end and <laughs> some other things to, to look for. But yeah, um, you want to jump back to the data real quick about yeah. uh, in the keyhole? Yeah, we'll go back to the data. And something that just kind of came to mind while we were talking about it is in the, in the keyhole, and I'll, I'll use the data to illustrate it a little bit. Um, so we're back here on the keyhole. I'm going to orient it so we're looking at it like we're approaching uh, the corner. And we're still on the long G channel. So what we're seeing on the GPS satellite image is our longitudinal G forces. And then we have our speed trace down here. Um, again, this is on the iPad version of the, uh, the iOS app. But um, is it, it's interesting because you um, – as you enter the corner, you're rolling in speed, and then about here, there's a little tiny crack back into the throttle and a release. And I think it's really important to distinguish that um, weight transfer that you're accomplishing by doing that from your commitment to power down on the exit. Um, you know, when when you release the brake and then have to go back to power here, it's simply because the corner's too long of a radius. It's kind of like um, Oak Tree at VIR, where you there's just simply too much space for you to make it one long braking occurrence the whole way. Um, you've got to do something. And so what you're doing is going to the power and then releasing it to put the weight back on the nose. And then you're committing back to power in one swift, you know, right. progression to pull throttle. Yeah, because once once you go to, to throttle, right, the car is going to uh, add understeer. Right? You're taking weight off the nose once you do that. So you really want, uh, it's so important to get that timing of the lift and turn um, correct so that you get basically you're you're condensing some of your rotation or your yaw to that point um, so you can get the car pivoted and then straighten out your exit um, when you go to throttle so that, getting that timing right of that, that that pitch turn or that that lift and yaw uh, to get the, the rotation done and then and then you go back to throttle and you're going to be straightening up from there so um, you, you got to get that timing right so it aims you at your apex point yeah, I look at the data here. Um, while it looks pretty good, um, I, th I think we have an indicator that we talked about before as we looked into um, the uh, the acceleration and um, and the speed trace was that there was a slight lift between apex and track out, or yeah, after throttle application there was a slight lift. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you found that there's a little blip in the uh, longitudinal acceleration, and then the speed trace showed that as well. Yeah, um, here's, our, here's our longitudinal G as well down here, so we can kind of sync the two of them up. But this is this little blip right here that we're looking at, right here. This is my longitudinal G trace accelerometer, and this is mid corner. So exactly what you're saying is this little you know braking occurrence, release of the brake pedal, and then what we're doing is right here, committing back to power and then coming back out of the throttle. Because of this dramatic drop from hard acceleration to deacceleration to then accelerating again that we're seeing right here. And, and this accelerometer data, and you mentioned it, it's, you kind of have to take it as a trend because it's 
always going to be a little buggy because accelerometers are experiencing a lot of acceleration, so they don't they don't naturally appear smooth. But what I see there is this big spike before the car is able to actually continuously accelerate. That spike drops off, goes from immediately from 0.3 or 0.4 positive g back down to 0.1, right? Mm-hmm. That's you know that's not the little when, when you're making an adjustment with the car. It's right around here. Once you're at this point. You know, we, he's also apex in a little early, um, so that's part of the reason he's committing back to power, and then he's, you know, going, oh, I was a little too early on the throttle, and rolling back out of it, and then going back to it. Um, but that's all stuff you can learn from the really microanalyzing longitudinal G trace. Yeah. So if I looked at that and I saw that there was a lift, or if I was the driver and I knew that I had, you know, made a, a small lift there, which you may tell yourself you didn't lift, but then the data may show <laughs> you that you did, right? But um, showing that would indicate that either the apex was a little bit too early or, or you got on throttle a little bit too early. Well, um, one way to aid that would be to make that, that lift and turn just, just a little bit later, um, mm-hmm. to get that, that, that pivot done a little bit later and then straighten up, um, a little bit more. Uh, and that would allow this driver to uh, commit the throttle a little bit sooner. Yeah. Um, it might change the trajectory of the approach to be, um, to come in, um, a little bit, a little bit closer to the curb uh, as he breaks past that first apex. Yeah, and make it slightly more V-shaped. Right yeah, just ever so slightly. You might be able to carry a little bit more weight on the nose on the way in there, um, and uh, and then make that lift a little bit later, and it might aid the uh, the exit as well. The big difference that I see in this, what this driver's doing um, versus you know your video is primarily that entry where you're you're steering a little more intentionally towards that first apex and although you're not right up against it you've already got and you mentioned this earlier you've already got the car arced and kind of pointed towards you know further right right like if you're looking at a compass you're going you know further around or the face of the clock you know if it's 12 o'clock straight ahead you're already looking at like two or three o'clock whereas he's kind of looking at one o'clock right he hasn't that initial turn towards you know arc towards that apex means that your car is rotated and you have to do less rotation at this part of the corner where Mike has, and we can see by this yellow coloring right here, um, you know, the car is starts to decelerate again. So he's, he's actually kind of close to zero acceleration. So he comes off the brakes. It, basically, like you're saying, if he had arced the car in a little bit more, waited a little bit longer mid corner to get that lift and turn in, then he wouldn't have had to come back out of the throttle here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that yellow that we're seeing right there um, that you're marked on right now, that's probably his lift. And, and it, that looks just, that looks a little bit early. So you, you may want to delay that just a bit more to get that uh, rotation done a little bit later and then be able to straighten out that track. That exit. Yeah. Cool. And that's a tricky corner. So I think that, that, um, that insight is huge because the, and it's easy to self analyze if you can, you know, even if you just have video or just have data, um, you know, what you're looking for in data is probably going to be longitudinal G. Um, and in the video, it's going to be listening to the throttle, right? And if you yeah. hear it. <laughs> and we could probably see his track out. It's probably going to be a little bit early if we zoom in there um, on, the, on the track out point. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he's very early on the, on the apex curve. But, I mean, he already made his adjustment so he could stay on track um, on this particular yeah. lap. But, um, yeah, that adjustment would, of that little bit later, um, uh, lift and turn would would help him on the on the track out. Right, and that's why you got out of the throttle again here, so he wouldn't run out of track out. Whereas, like yeah. you said, if he had done that lift later and gotten the car pointed a little bit better, but um, yeah, so now he's now he's going down the straightaway. That's where we see relatively little longitudinal acceleration. So we'll we'll transition back over to the video um, for the next uh, the next kind of compilation of corners. See how proficient I can get at switching between the two. Hmm. Let's, uh, do you want to stay there, actually? Um, sure. So if, if anybody's not, not familiar with the track, they can kind of see from the, from the GPS view or from the satellite view, you know, where the, where the track's going to go. Um, so as we just saw from the video, you know, we're approaching, we're in that braking zone for what I call turn seven. If, if this was the club course with all the turns, this would be the seventh turn, the kink being the, fifth, uh, the sixth. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just going to use my nomenclature, and everybody else can figure it out based on theirs. <laughs> um, so what you see is is a right, left, right in in view. Now that left hand turn is at the peak of a hill, and it's referred to as madness. Um, and the over 
writing thing that we need to look at as we look at this this sequence of three turns is that you have a straightaway coming into seven and you have what you can't quite see but an acceleration zone coming out of nine so eight right. which is madness the left-hander mm -hmm. is at the peak of a of a curve or of a curve sorry it's at the peak um uh, topography is at the is at the peak right at the apex basically mm -hmm. um so you're coming over a crest it's slow it's the second slowest corner on the on the track and there's nowhere to go after it so basically it's a throwaway okay so you want to optimize the turn before and the turn after compromising turn eight the left hander here as necessary yeah. so with that in mind we'll go look at turn seven um at the end of the straight so uh, we got a hard braking zone. This is the hardest braking zone on the track. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll we'll see the reference points in a moment. But um, you'll want to use uh, the majority of the track out, if not all of the track out on exit, carrying your speed through here. This turn is on camber. Um, and again, that's your compromises. You're carrying all this speed off of the back straight. You want to carry that as long and deep as possible. Um, and compromise that slow turn as necessary to uh, to maximize your speed, your high speed uh, through through turn uh, seven. Mm -hmm. So this is probably a good place to go back to the video. Um, All right. And look at the the approach from in car. Uh, there is a surface ref, a couple surface references, but we uh, we just went past a break in the wall. Actually, can you just jump back like? Couple seconds. Okay. Um, you'll see a break in the wall on the left as we approach down. Uh, no, sorry, continue on. Uh, right. As we come up to the breaking zone here, pause there. Uh, it's the 500 mark right there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get into the, and then the cones start at the 400, 300, 200, 100. So uh, most cars are going to be breaking at the limit at around the 300 or 350, depending on the car. A quicker car, maybe a little bit earlier depending on the, the arrow level and the, and the grip level etc um, but I just want to point out those reference points for your for your breaking marks um, on the left uh, you got the marks along or the uh, signs along the fence yeah and then the cones along the track yeah there's the break that you're talking about that kind of starts yeah. off and it's pretty steep downhill right towards the towards the turn-in point um, yeah it comes in but it, but it picks up camber as well so um, okay. it's kind of yeah, so I think it's a net gain, um, but it's going to be you're going to do a you know a long break release and really try to manage floating speed into the into the corner um, and continuing your scrub on the way in because like I said you want to you want to carry as much speed into and through turn seven as possible. Um, and why don't you just play through to the uh, the exit of turn seven? Bring it in, just touching the apex curve there. And you see I'm using using almost all of the track out there. Mm -hmm. um, in a momentum car, I'd say leaving maybe half a car width at the most is 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 good. Um, in a high power car, um, you can use you can use and probably should use every bit of that. Mm. The only the only reason is because um, you you start crossing the threshold of the um, of the kind of cost benefit of uh, of how much you throw away in eight, mm. and uh, in a in a slow car you can't recover that speed as easily. And right. I've found that there's just there's a tenth or so there. Uh, yeah. Just leave about half a car width there. And from this point, um, I'm going to continue turning right um, to with any residual grip that I have. If I didn't track out all the way to the left, I'm going to just keep pulling the car right and pull it away from the of the from the grass just a little bit and use whatever residual grip i have if i have any to set up for uh for turn eight mm. again that's if i have residual grip i'll use it to set up but i don't set up naturally or i don't give up anything in seven to set up for eight um, i love that term residual grip because it's it really puts an emphasis on carrying speed through seven um mm -hmm. instead of saying because you, you can tell and even this car in front of go back a little bit look how far he is over here track right yeah right and and so he obviously did not optimize his entry to seven which 
he's not watching this now, so he doesn't realize how much he missed out on, but he's trying <laughs> to get a good run through aid and out of it, which, you know, you explained earlier, but I think that was a great way to reference it. And looking, looking at the, at the speed trace, um, and Mike's data, his, his minimum speed is 59 miles per hour, 60 miles per hour. So I would call it like a very, very solid mid speed corner where it's, you know, you're releasing the brake as you come in, you want the rear tires rotating at a slightly higher rate than the front, but you still want to be able to get on the throttle as soon as you can. And I think these are the kinds of corners that really separate that. Like, I think if you're not at the limit of the tire, you're not a pro level guy. These are the types of corners that there's always a lot of meat there, right? Yeah. Let's talk about throttle for a second because, um, you know, if there was a straightaway following this, getting on the throttle as soon as possible would be, would be important. But in reality here, the later that you're able to get on throttle, that means the more speed that you actually carried through the corner. Right. So in actuality, if you're getting on throttle, I mean, yes, get on throttle as soon as you can based on how much residual grip you have. Right. But Goes if back you're to not, yeah, if you're not able to get on the throttle at all or until the very kind of like three quarters of the way through the turn, that means you're carrying really good speed through the turn and you didn't leave yourself enough grip. Well, you didn't have to, but you were carrying, you know, kind of maximum speed to where you can't even get back on the throttle. But that's the important thing here is carrying speed through the turn, not really accelerating out of it. Yeah. So if you barely get back to throttle or, you know, only for a short time or even not at all, because you're at literally at the limit of the cor of the tires through the entire turn, uh, you're likely doing it as best you could. Mm. That's there's there's some corners like that that are that are similar that have the um, and and that's something that we're not taught in the track day HVD world until you get into a competitive environment where you're searching for every tenth of a second, right? Because it's you know this is a super complex corner in that. Um, like you said, it's all about rolling speed. And then you also mentioned the distance related thing, which is that residual grip, use it to get the car back over to the right. And I thought it was super intriguing that you said in a momentum car or a, tra a non-traction limited car, a slower car with a lot of grip, um, as we play the video a little bit, going all the way to the exit is not quite worth how much more speed that allows you to roll because you're driving, you know, this is the inside of the track over here on the right. So you're, you're physically driving more distance around the outside of the track and you track out more. So I, that was very insightful. And also this corner is very similar to turn six at Road Atlanta. I don't know if you know that corner very well, but it's yeah, yeah. all about entry speed, right? Mm -hmm. Literally doesn't matter when you get on the throttle because you're going to be you know, immediately slowing the car down yeah. again. Yeah. Um, and it's cambered on the entry. Um, it, it's not as hard of a braking zone. You don't have that big speed delta, whereas, you know, turn six, you only gain at Road Atlanta. Um, just using that as a reference for anyone that's familiar with that track, the speed delta from your V max to your V min in the corner is not as big as it is for this corner, right? Here we're going, um, you know, in, in this car and probably in Mike's 944, 110 to 120 miles per hour, and you're slowing 60 miles per hour, right? So it's a Breaking late matters is what I'm trying yep. to say, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was uh, 118 to 60. Okay. In my case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, um, su that's super insightful. So priorities here, again, residual, use what residual grip you have on the exit, meaning all you're focused on here is break as late as possible, roll as much speed through the corner. So it's a high commitment um, corner that really rewards good technique and, and smooth brake release, right? Yep. Yep. And then as we approach eight, you know, we're going to be pulling back to the right just with, again, whatever residual grip we have. Um, you know, SPEC E30 would be back on, on throttle here and then create a quick little straightaway to, uh, to brake right there and then and quickly transitioning right back to the, uh, to the left. But um, if you are carrying high speed through there, you will have to, you know, make that a braking zone. Um, you can't just kind of like lift and scrub your way up through there. Um, you'll need to scrub just a bit of speed there. Um, and for reference, I come out of seven at 69 and my min speed over the crest was uh, 48. Hmm. So just for reference. Now it is climbing on your, on your way up. Um, and then you'll, you'll get to that uh, crest. Now the relatively early in the curb, maybe third or so blocks into the red and white curb, 
um, would be your apex point. Yeah, right around there. There's a definitive groove on the way in there. You can almost kind of see two tire tracks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. There, right? um, where everybody's, everybody's running. So um, we'll get in there early, feeding all the steering in early while you're going up the hill. And now you can see there's a horizon there, right? So mm -hmm. the road's going to drop off. You have to actively open your hands and respond to that reduction of grip by reducing your steering input. Okay, and just let the car let the car float uh, over over the crest as you're trying to um, put you know some throttle on. Mm -hmm. um, there's that steering reduction right there. Yep. As the car gets light, you start unwinding. Mm -hmm. Yep. And where you come over the crest, where you end up here. Um, coming across the track, I don't really care. Mid track, three quarters of the way across, all the way track right, doesn't really matter as long as you can get all the way back to the left to set up for nine. That's the key. Mm. So you have to get all the way back over to the left. Because again, you don't want to compromise anything in, uh, in, in corner nine coming up because there's an acceleration zone after it. So if there's any compromise, it's gonna be here in eight to make sure you can get um, all the way back to the to the left. That's you can awesome. see ahead of us, we're heading pretty steeply downhill. Yeah. So you're going to need to brake sooner than you think, or sooner than you know, a relatively flat turn or flat approach, and turn in a little bit sooner than you otherwise would because you're not going to have that response because the car is headed downhill. Yeah, that's a really really important point because. Once you start driving the car, at the, you know, the closer you get to driving the car, at the limit of the car, all these little topographical changes really, really start to matter, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the track that it's fallen away. So your goal, I, I love that. You kind of summarize it into your only goal through here is to get all the way over here before you turn in, right? Yep. Yep. And these are the the keys that you kind of hit these points, and you know the speed's going to come naturally. So if you really force yourself to be vigilant about doing these things, um, you'll, you'll find the speed. Gotcha. Awesome. I, um, we can look at the data if you want, or we can keep, keep moving on the video. I think yeah, let's take a quick peek at it just to get us up to this point. All right. Go over to it real quick. And what did you say the minimum speed was for you in the, uh, in the spec E30? Uh, I think it was 60. Okay. Yeah, it looks like Mike in our um, in our control car here is right around 59 miles per hour at his slowest. Okay. And he actually, I noticed this earlier, Mike, if you're watching this, which I hope you will uh, at some point, because I, I asked him if we could use his data, and he was ecstatic that we were using his data. But, Thanks, uh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, you know, and, and the track definitely is going downhill a little bit. We're back in, in you know, the end of the back straightaway here, turn seven. Um, it almost looks like, and, and you could tell me, we'll go back to long G because that's what we're looking at, but it almost looks like there might be a little bit of time on the entry because he's actually already starting to accelerate pretty considerably by the apex of the corner. All right. Yeah, the, the, that potential is there. It, I mean, his line is looking, is looking really good. Um, yeah, he probably could float a couple more, you know, another mile an hour or two on the, on the way in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess my, my personal gauge, my self gauge would be how soon did I get back to throttle? If I, if I couldn't get back to throttle until I was you know, past the apex, um, then that's good in a, in a, in a momentum car though, you know, going to the throttle doesn't change a whole lot in some cases. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so he may be, you know, getting back to throttle and, um, as maybe I was, I'd have to go back and look at the video with, with audio. Um, yeah. Or maybe I can check my longitudinal. Um, yeah. It looks like there's a little, a little bit of potential. And, and again, like we talked about, this is a corner that really reports technique. So what I'm looking at right now is longitudinal G both on the, on the GPS image and the uh, graph image below, which is the benefit of having um, the iPad version of the app that I've, started to mention several times now, but he, he definitely is accelerating a little bit before the apex. So what I would say, purely looking at the data without looking at this video or anything, I would say that there's probably a little more um, rolling speed to be to be had on the entry. The left front tire probably has a little more grip. And also it's really interesting to watch the, I'm gonna replay the data and then we'll move on to the next corner. But if you press the play button on the data here, which is this lower 
triangle right here, you can replay it at more or less the speed that, that it was, you know, that it was happening right in real time. Mm -hmm. And what I look at when I look at the apex lights is where did, where did the lights appear um, during this, uh, during this, you know, set of corners. And that's what I kind of want to use as, as my gauge for how I approach it. Right. So, so it's right, right there where it go, starts showing more red, right? Right. So that's, that's where, and this is a lot of times going to be the place where, because the blending the friction circle with our turn in and break release is always kind of going to be that point where, yeah, there's always probably a little bit more grip. Um, but what I'm thinking that we can could do here, Mike, that what I would basically recommend, and this is based off of what I'm seeing with the G-Trace and just the apex lights here, are this, this, these red apex lights nicely correlate with um, this spike. And I don't know if you can see that, Anthony, but I'll go back to where I had that set up right here. The G's are going to, so we're, we're breaking here. This is probably a little bump from a downshift. And then the G's actually start to go back to zero. So they start releasing the brake pedal, but then there's this last deceleration occurrence right here. Mm -hmm. And it's too big to just be a just a just a you know one of these guys a little accelerometer peak. It looks fairly mm -hmm. concerted. So what I think is happening there is Mike might have lack a little bit of confidence that if he just keeps rolling out of the brake pedal, the car is going to make the corner. So that's a slight reapplication of the brake pedal, and that's what makes the lights appear because now when he turns the wheel, we're going to have overslowed by a couple miles per hour, and the grip's not quite there, uh, or you're not quite utilizing all the grip. Um, so all I would say there, Mike, is that I'm, I'm willing to bet that you went to the brake pedal, you relaxed it like you were coming out of it for the corner, and then you reapplied. Um, so that's a, a really, really subtle thing, but it would probably help um, to minimize that second reapplication by either just staying on the brake pedal um, a little bit longer uh, in the, you know, at your threshold, right, and then just one concerted release. Um, or maybe just continue this this release that we saw right here. It's probably the it's just a little too thin, and that made the weight come off the nose, right? And didn't feel like it was going to turn. Um, there's there's an outside chance that he'd have to tell us if if that was a kind of an awkward downshift. Could have been that too, but mm -hmm. um, but yeah. that close to the corner entry, yeah, it was probably um, kind of going back to the brake a little bit to yeah. you know, maybe it, it definitely check or something. Yeah, it definitely could be the downshift as well. We'll, we'll keep moving ahead. But, okay. um, and I'll just kind of reflect what, you know, he's doing, taking a similar approach. This looks like uh, he's braking going into madness, whereas in, in your video, I don't know how hard you were braking or not because uh, I can't see the, the feet. But um, it looks yeah, like I was, was, was braking, as I as I mentioned, um, the, the speed was, let's say, I went from a peak of about 69 down to a min speed of, 47 over the crest. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's with continued deceleration over the crest, but, um, but yeah, there is definitely a, a break zone there. In fact, I break relatively hard and short. I had a, keep, keep in mind, it's going uphill. Okay. So I had a 0.87 max spike at the initial. Yeah. Um, so about, yeah, I figure 0.7 G for a very short, uh, for a very short time. And then, and then uh, pulling off as, as you, you know, turn the car up the hill. Yeah. Yeah. That Mike has a really similar approach and his minimum speed is actually slightly quicker at the top of the hill. A um, little bit more contact patch on this car too. He's right at like 40, 49, 50 miles per hour, right at the crest of, of madness. And then it looks like yeah, he got, your advice. I've got a bunch of excuses lined up as to why he's quicker than me there. Do you want me to go through them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll just start. Just <laughs> um, you know, that's interesting. Something I learned a long time ago with, uh, when we were running the, because we kind of overlapped very briefly at World Challenge, but mm -hmm. I think it was, I guess, 2016, the year before you ran the BMW, I had a right. team that ran the court with me, and I was over a second quicker than him at Laguna, but in all of the relatively slow corners, he was slightly quicker, and um, I was just charging the corners too much and compromising when I got on the throttle, and he was a lot more patient and got the throttle sooner. And had I not been able to overlay his data with mine, I would have never seen that opportunity. Uh, but it helped me find a lot of time. So you don't always have to be faster to learn something. It's absolutely true. I mean, I've had those experiences. Somebody running, you know, same lap time within five thousandths of a second, but we have a second variance almost between us at different parts on the track. 
and applied both things. Actually, it was, it was, uh, James Clay and I were both running an E90 at uh, NJMP. And I saw, or he, he kind of let me know what he was doing in his section where he was quicker. I told him what I was doing in my section out where I was quicker. And yeah, sure enough, next time out, dropped, uh, dropped like a second off the lap time. So it's how teams <laughs> make each other faster, even if they're running the same, the same times. Yeah, absolutely. So all, all that to say, don't, don't uh, be shy about, um, you know, looking at someone's data who might not be faster than you because uh, it, it doesn't really matter how you figure out. And it's that relentless pursuit of trying to learn something and have an attitude that I can learn something from, you know, somebody else's data or even my slower laps. You know, some people are hesitant to only overlay their two fastest laps. And I always find that even on, on a slower lap in traffic or in something, I might have done something better. Something, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, but you want to transition back over to the video as we talk yeah, about um, let's Let's just look at the line here um, in, the, in the overhead shot. Um, okay. So we see we've got some S's coming up. And uh, as we go through nine, um, you got you can see two yellow curbs on the left. So that red bar basically across the, the track is the Honda Bridge, as we refer to it. Um, but you've got a yellow curb right before it that goes on, under it. And then you've got a yellow curb just past it there on the left. Yep. And then um, and right about at that point, or just um, kind of at the end of that yellow curb, is, is a crest. You're going uphill on the way in there, and then you're going to crest at that yellow curb, more or less. And then um, you'll get into the right hander as um, so this sequence I refer to as nine, which is just passed. Ten is under the Honda Bridge. Eleven is that soft right, and then twelve being the crest or the right hander into what we refer to as Thunder Valley. Gotcha. We just want to set ourselves up here for what what we've got coming up, and as we go back to the video. Awesome. All right, I'll shift back over to the video. All right, so we'll start. Right. Yeah, so we're coming down the hill, turned in early. Uh, touch that card, pause it there if you would. Okay, um, so okay. I've, so turn nine is setting up kind of this acceleration zone. It's definitely not a straightaway, but it is, it is a full throttle acceleration zone um, through the next series of turns. Um, the, uh, the thing to focus on is getting back to full throttle um, and staying at full throttle through uh, turn 10, this left-hander ahead of us under the Honda Bridge, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so I've tracked out about three quarters of the way across the track to the left. If I if there was nothing after turn nine, right, I would use all that track out room to the left. But if I did that, I would not be able to stay full throttle through the left-hand turn and it'd be scrubbing a bunch of speed there and, and, and trading off more than what I had gained by getting on throttle sooner. So, so tell yourself to get on throttle as soon as possible without having to, and track out as much as possible with the limit being uh, not having to lift through 10 under the Honda bridge, okay? So in a higher horsepower car, you are definitely gonna go a little bit slower through, uh, through nine uh, with a later apex and stay further to the right, maybe only a quarter of the way across the track from the right, or maybe half staying there a little bit longer and then transitioning back to the left so you can stay on throttle uh, through 10, which is ahead of us, okay? Mm -hmm. um, now the apex point that you're gonna be targeting is right at the end of the yellow curb, you'll find a dirt patch there and, and that's what uh, we're gonna be hitting right there, you can see it. Yeah. So yeah. tire on the yellow curb or half a tire on the yellow curb, you just need, wanna be nice and tight there. Um, but here's where people kind of, uh, can lose their way a little bit, keep turning the car left as you pass that. That is, just because the curb ends, it doesn't mean that's the release from the turn. In fact, in a slow, a slower, softer car like a Spec E30, I keep the car relatively tight to the left, and, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But you remember from the overhead, we have another yellow uh, curb on the left-hand side, and as you come up to where the car is ahead of us, you're going to be completely unsighted. You're not going to see any track in front of you. So you need a reference point in that. And if you're, if you're, if you start releasing from the left side of the track where we are right now, or from where the apex is just ahead of us, you're going to end up um, driving off the track to the right as you, as you come over the crest. So as you, as you uh, come past here, I would, I stay, uh, tight to the left until you get to the next yellow curb, and that's when I release. So you can't see anything here. Mm -hmm. Right here, now you can see it. 
that's where you straighten up, okay? That's true. And Thank you come straight over that crest. Um, in a fast car, I mean, some some people refer to this as the as the jump. In a high horsepower car, you can spin up tires over over this crest uh, if you don't have adequate downforce to combat that. Um, but now here's where the compromise comes between a high horsepower car and a, and a maybe slower or softer car. So as the car ahead of us actually just drove right to the red and white curb at the apex, I tend to run a little bit wider arc through here, uh, keeping my car about a half car width off of the red and white curbing and running a wider arc. Yeah, this curbing. That curbing there, yes. A wider arc through here. Um, as I approach, uh, you know, the approach to turn 12. Hmm. Now I'll come back and talk about a high horsepower car in a moment, but I run a wider arc so that I can get out a little bit sooner to the left and straighten up a little bit sooner and kind of come more parallel to the left, uh, to the curb on the left side, which is the next yellow curb. Um, because the whole challenge here, you can see me straightening up my hands actively, actively straightening up my hands and coming up, you know, pretty parallel to this yellow curb. Right. As we approach the right hander here into Thunder Valley, which is turn 12 in my book, um, everybody's afraid of turning in too early because of the implications of an early turn in, of a typical early turn in. But, but the reality is that the challenge is actually getting turned in early enough. You're carrying a whole lot of speed here. You have very uh, limited time and space to break in and or to get the car slowed down at all and the car is is pretty unresponsive to turn in um, as you're kind of off camber and flat here or flat you know through this through this section so um, I bring the car out I let the car uh, run out a little bit wider I don't actually ever get it completely straight and I don't want to I run a longer lighter break versus kind of versus straightening up and breaking hard and then turning again. Mm -hmm. I'll keep, I'll keep, a, I'll be turning, I'll release the steering while I break, right? Just I'm moving myself on that friction circle. Right. Um, but by keeping some load on the left side, when I, when I release the brake, I'm still loaded. I still have some load there. And, mm -hmm. and when I release the brake, the car is more responsive and will turn up that hill, which is, uh, which is the tough thing. If you're trying to, manage that weight transfer for all the way on the nose to all the way on the side. It just takes so long that you end up sacrificing a whole lot of um, entry speed to this corner. Right. Which done to a straightaway. Makes tons of sense. And it's all exemplified by the softer sprung car that you mentioned, you know, being a spec E30 or, or similar, right? You, yep. really, you really have to respect how long that, that transition of the weight mm -hmm. takes. That's, that's brilliant stuff. I mean, the, especially with uh, the discussion of the friction circle and how you have to kind of manipulate it. I think a lot of times on the racetrack, especially with it, our adrenaline bumping, we always want to break later and harder. Where this is yep. definitely the kind of corner where being more reserved really helps. Yep, this is definitely a spot where like late breaking, um, you know, unless you're in a side-by-side -side situation, um, is not going to be to your uh, advantage. In fact, you Typically, it's it's getting straightened up soon enough to to break um, is the or to apply some brake is the challenge. Yeah, and then get off the brake soon enough to actually get the car to turn. Uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. So here you are, and this is, you know, when when I first watched this video, this is one of the things I noticed because I haven't seen a lot of onboards um, that really have this dramatic of that kind of earlier turn in concept that you mentioned, but it, it works out so seamlessly. And I'm sure it's one of those things where it feels a little weird at first, but it, it really all pays dividends on the other side. Of the yeah, this turn is similar to turn eight over madness where it's climbing. We're now going uphill. Um, so you get good grip on the entry, but there's gonna be a crest kind of right past the apex point that you're gonna need to let the car just wash out when you go over that crest. So we're doing all of our turning going up the hill. So um, you see a lot of steering input at this point, and I'm gonna apex on that curb. You should absolutely be getting all over that curb um, in pretty much any car, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if you're not, then you didn't turn in soon enough, you didn't get off the brake soon enough or what have you. Um, but at this point, getting back on the throttle, and then as we, as we go forward, um, let's pause right there. 
you can see the, if you need an indicator, um, uh, kind of when you're before you're over the crest and can see where you're going, there's a gap in the trees, which is right ahead of dead center from me right now, right? So if you need some, if you kind of more of are a, a, um, the type of driver that wants a visual reference uh, kind of in the distance to kind of line themselves up, that's a good one that a lot of people use. I tend to use more surface references, <clears throat> but I'll just put that out there for people who want to use that. Mm. But at this point, I'm over the crest, actively opening my hands, letting the car come across the track and um, applying as much power as, as possible. In Spec E30, it's typically remaining at full throttle. Um, you get some, get a little bit of wheel spin, just open the hands and let, you know, stay in the gas and let the car, um, you know, let, give the car the freedom to, to use all your track out all the way to the yellow curb. And then the car is going to settle kind of right as you get to the yellow curb and then you can feed in just a hair more, just a little bit more steering to kind of finish your turn right as you get there. There. Yep. Still got steering at this point, just kind of finishing off that, kind of making up for what grip you didn't have as the car crested the hill to some extent. Yeah, you need to do, you know, you're you're only able to do two percent of your steering when you're coming down that you know, past that crest. So ninety-eight percent of your steering has to be, you know, between you know, before the before you get to that point and then this very last little bit. And I'd say maybe this is, you know, five percent of it and the other now I've lost my math, five, two. <laughs> so the other 93% of it was uh, was before. Um, the front side of the hill. Uh, yeah, on the front side of the turn, yeah. Yeah, this is, a, you know, reminds me of a lot of different corners to other tracks as well, which I always like comparing, especially well-known tracks to one another, because it, it just really, you know, helps you kind of think about it. But any track where you have this turning and crest kind of rally scenario where your co-driver would say, and quite four over crest, you know, is, is like this scenario where you're just trying to minimize everything with the car. It's almost like do less. So do, do you see a lot of people that commit back to power, think they were committed back too early and then chop the throttle at the crest of the hill and end up with a big problem when the weight goes to the nose? Look where all the tires are ahead of us. Oh yeah. We're all the right side of the track. <laughs> right. Everybody hooks it. Everybody hooks it across the track, and there's you know there's nothing on the left side. Everybody's afraid of early apexing, early turn and early apex, and going off the left side of the track. But the reality is that, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. If there's any problem, it's before you even get to the turn, and you know they never even get into the turn. So mm -hmm. it's all with um, people getting over aggressive on the throttle, and and the car getting loose over the crest, and then when when it settles on on the back side, then hooking across the track, or you know, if they do go off past the yellow curve on the left side, you know, bring it back on too aggressively. But, um, yeah, the, the tracks usually are pretty, pretty good at putting the tires in the risky <laughs> areas. <laughs> but there's been plenty of time for them to analyze uh, who's, who's hit, the I mean, uh, hit where. Yeah. Um, that's, the exit. that's, that's super interesting. I, I love this, this section of corners because it rewards any, any soft brake application, light, long brake application corner. I really like because that's a, a lot of times if you're in a, in a race or something and you're trying to catch somebody um, and you can, you can get in their mirror and, and make them want to apply the brakes later for a corner. This is the kind of place where you can gain a little bit of time on somebody to plan a pass because you're able to have more restraint and, and really drive the car the way it needs to be driven. But um, do you want to take a look at the data real quick here? Yeah, let's do that. All right, we'll get back over to the data. And I'll just point out a couple of quick things that, that I noticed. I'm still on uh, the longitudinal G channel. And and this, like we looked at before, this overhead view is, is really nice. I think the, you know, the, this GPS line, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it, it does shift slightly depending on um, satellite position. And, you know, this is just a static image that's pulled from Apple Maps. So um, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's very consistent around the track and you look at it enough and you can really figure out kind of where the, where the car actually is. So I think with the, as much distance as we actually have between Mike's driven line and this curb, we know that he lifted here because of, and we'll go back to what we looked at a little while ago, this blip in the speed trace. And I'm looking right down here, this little bitty blip. Because I, I know from his video that he doesn't upshift until to fourth gear until right here. Until the crest, yeah. Yep. So this is this is just our little relax off the throttle. And that all all starts back here where Anthony really emphasized the late turn in from the left side of the track here. So Mike might have started bending the car in a little too early here, and you can it, it's 
it's hard to exactly tell, but I think he could have gotten a slightly later apex here and then been able to hold the car further track left. Here. Yeah. And there's two ways he could have modified his approach there um, to, to be more track right on his approach to 10. So one would have been a later apex uh, through nine, the right-hander there, the first right-hander that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Later apex there, mm -hmm. or a slightly later throttle application. But the indicator to himself from in-car would have been, oh, I had to lift through 10 to stay tight to that apex, to that dirt patch there under the Honda bridge. I'd have this slight lift. So next time around, do I use a little bit later apex or do I wait just a hair longer to get on the throttle? But either way, either one of those would have, would allow him to stay a little bit tighter coming out of nine, a little bit tighter right coming out of nine, and then enabled him to stay flat through 10 under the bridge. Right, and this is probably much more prevalent in a higher horsepower car as well. And I know we, we're gonna address that a little bit about, and you already talked about how the line would be different, but if you have 500 plus horsepower and you're trying to put it down exiting um, you know, nine right here, that, that lift is probably going to be pretty prevalent if you don't get the car set up just right. It'll be easier to find than it is in the 944 because it's probably a very little, you know, adjustment off the throttle. It's not a big lift, right? It's just mm -hmm. an adjustment. Um, so we know, and, and that's just from, you know, we don't have throttle position. You know, this car is not a, um, you know, it's an old, uh, an older car, um, similar area to the, to the E30. That's just from looking at the speed trace and the longitudinal G trace and, and, and also, the, and you can see it on the speedometer on the left side of the screen right here, you can see how it stalls at 67 miles per hour, even though we are going slightly uphill. So it could, <laughs> also has to do with the fact that- it actually dropped from 68 to 67, yeah, and then went back up, yep. Yep, so that's definitely our little speed adjustment. Um, so that's, a, that's really easy to analyze, and that's just some low-hanging fruit, but I think what's so important about this whole section of the track, and you hear it, Anytime in car races or sports car races, where they always talk about not having room to pass and everything being really tight. And it's because this track, every corner and, and this section, everything, you know, if you had a bad run um, or, or didn't get this part of the track sorted as you're coming into, um, you know, trying to beat your madness, then the, it, everything affects everything at this point, right? It's like, yeah. you don't really have time to reset. Um, right, yeah. They, they say that Mid-Ohio is uh, a, mo a uh, a rhythm track, right? And mm -hmm. that's part of, that's really why is that one turn leads into another, leads into another. And, you know, so one thing affects another and you, and when you find that the rhythm or how, how, you know, that, that line that where everything kind of flows together, um, then it, it feels like you're in a good rhythm. But what it really is, is trading off um, or prioritizing the right things, right? Mm -hmm. Like we said, between seven and eight and nine, right? Eight is, eight is the throwaway to optimize uh, seven and nine. Mm. That's, that's really what it's about. That's really, that's really important. Prioritize the right things. Yeah. Um, and you gotta, you gotta, you kind of have to learn from people that have done a lot of um, driving and analysis and, and doing what we're doing, which is the real, the real kind of guts behind learning how to go fast before you can really learn what those things are. Um, just a couple of things real quick before we move off of this. And I think there's one big question here that I've had that, I'm sure a lot of other people have had, but we can see in Mike's long G trace, we've got a little, you know, initial application about negative 0.7 G, a relax of the brake pressure, um, and then reapplying to negative 0.7 G. And that's usually evidenced by a downshift, right? Yep. That's that subtle, 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 even if you get it perfect with a heel toe, there's going to be some um, release or even just the drivetrain um, actually changing the weight distribution slightly as you, you know, the chassis and drivetrain kind of, gets uh, jolted by that that downshift but so so my question is and there's other things we can look at here but the big one to me is third or fourth gear right um, because a lot of cars are going to be between gears here right yeah and and that's the that's the tricky thing is that you're you know if you go to fourth gear um, you have to manage downshift to third uh, while when you're breaking not in a straight line so it's a difficult thing to do to to manage that downshift there um, but in my opinion, if, if you're hitting the rev limiter, you know, somewhere, if you're hitting the rev limiter kind of you know, before that red and white curb mm -hmm. that in view that, yeah, if you're hitting the rev limiter before that, it's, it's likely worth going to, you know, fourth at the, at the crest of the hill at the, mm -hmm. at the top of the hill and then making a, another quick downshift. Um, instead of just sitting there cause you, you do gain speed cause you're coming downhill through there. So you, you will gain speed, mm -hmm. um, as you come through that section. But uh, line-wise, 
Um, I was going to talk about the high horsepower line, the difference between that and the low yeah. horsepower line. Yeah. Um, in my viewpoint, uh, Mike's approach here is more, more, first of all, it's typical, okay, of, of what most people, how most people would approach um, this, this corner. And, and my approach is staying a little bit wider of the curb in a softer car, um, I don't think is commonly used. Um, but in a higher horsepower car, you basically need to give yourself a straightaway braking zone to simply get that speed scrubbed off. Mm -hmm. So you almost need to straight line uh, from the curbing, from the red and white curbing out to the yellow curbing at the left. Mm -hmm. So um, where I'm you know, out wider, running a wider arc and coming into that yellow curb more parallel to it and thus turning it sooner for 12. In a higher horsepower car, that just sacrifices too much speed when you could be accelerating harder and braking harder and just getting literally getting there sooner, just point and shoot kind of mentality works in a higher horsepower car. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there is a compression at the, at the red and white curb. Um, so you use that to you know, turn the car and then and depending on your power level, you might actually you know, need to start your braking there. Um, but then you'd straighten up the wheel considerably more um, as you head out to the yellow curb and then, and then turn it in. Um, from the yellow curb. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, we'll, we'll edit, edit that out. Uh, <laughs> that's a that's an important distinction. Um, you know, a car that's got more power than grip, or that that just has high horsepower, and covers a lot of ground, ground really quickly. That's uh, that's that's the principal difference, right? It's um, there's not a there's not a ton of differences. You still got four tires, and you're still trying to manage the grip, but it's it's just that prioritization, if you will. You're probably you have to prioritize something a little differently because you're covering ground more quickly. Whereas in the, in the E30, you really can slow less to accomplish rolling more speed through by breaking softer and not having that kind of point and shoot. Um, yeah. That looks great. Do you want, do you want to do a, a, you know, run through Thunder Valley real quick and look at the yeah, let's do that. line and then go back to the video. Yep. Awesome. So I, I also have a slightly different approach here, which, um, either Brian Till or Tommy Burns, one of the mid Ohio instructors, um, that, uh, that I picked this up from a long time ago, but the approach to, okay, so I'm calling 13, the soft right here in Thunder Valley and then 14, the fast left. So as we come down into Thunder Valley, there's a bridge that we're going to go under. Yep. And as we approach, um, 14, I'm going to stay out to the left a little bit longer this is a soft is a soft right hand turn. You will not be at the limit of the grip of your car's grip in anything as you go through the right hander. <clears throat> so what you can do is condense your steering or your turning by staying straight a little bit longer, turning a little bit harder for a shorter distance, and then straightening up a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what that does is you can see where his breaking point is, but that gives us a little bit more straightaway there in that area with which to use to break the car and then get it turned. This is a spot where we don't, uh, we don't want to, you know, shift the weight all the way from one side all the way to the other, like, you know, a quick transition, especially in a soft car from one way to the other, right. um, because you do need to break just a little bit there. So if you give yourself a, a little bit of a straightaway, so you bring the, the weight from the left side of the car to the nose, and then from the nose to the right side of the car as you, as you transition left, um, that's the approach. So, Here's really why it's important. As you look at this turn, <clears throat> it's an increasing radius turn. So if the wall was not there on the right, and you can see he's, he's lined up right to it. Mm -hmm. But if that wall, which is colored red, <clears throat> was not there, you would be, you'd be set up on the other side of it if the, if the pavement was there. Mm -hmm. Because you'd want, just for your maximum radius, you would want to set up that far wide, but you can't do that. So you want to get as close to it as possible, which is right up next to the red wall. And if we, if we kind of do that hook that I was referring to on the approach through 13, it gets us, it gets us lined up a little bit straighter, really nice and close to the red wall. Um, and as we look at the video, I think it'll make a little bit more sense as to why. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I love that mentality of um, really thinking about how you're approaching, even, even though that seems like a very simple part of the track where, Hey, I just got to get set up parallel to the, to the, uh, to the wall on the right. Um, I like that uh, mentality that you bring to it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's still a lot that has to happen there. 
Absolutely. And the, and the, you know, if you had your fuzzy dice hanging from the rear view mirror here, that, that'd be what I'm thinking about through here, right? Because what you said is wait a little bit longer, turn a little bit more. Whereas if you start turning early, you're going to see those dice swing over to the left kind of gently. You want them to move a little more quickly, but you also don't want to put all the weight on the left side of the car because then you just got to put it back on the nose to go to the, to the, to the left and load the right side of the car. So that's, that's a great illustration. So there's that quick steering input you're talking about. Yep. Pretty so I'm staying a little bit further out left. And again, I'm not defending about against anybody here, so I'm not giving somebody you know a, a potential run inside of me. I'm, this is just my own optimal line. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get straightened up, right up next to the red wall, and um, to emphasize the importance of this, I have scraped mirrors on that wall, mm -hmm. okay, because it's that important to get si get lined up as as far right as possible. Right and. So if you're nice and parallel with that wall too, there's, you know, other than scraping some paint off the car, there's not a whole lot of, of things that can go wrong, right? From being too close right. to the wall. Theoretically. Yeah. yeah. But your, so your tires should be um, on or just to the right of that white line, especially as, you know, it kind of, you kind of see where the, the line straightens out ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we're going to be straight. And if, if, let's just point to the end of the, the asphalt that's on the right side of the white line right there right so there I, I look at that as like a corner of the grass there's a the grass starts right there and there's this little corner where it meets that white line and my right side tire right here yep my right side tire is going to be to the right side of that white line I'm going to have just a brush just a brush a break um let's I'll give you a lateral acceleration or sorry, longitudinal acceleration, about a 0.6. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it was a 0.68, I mean, but so brief. It's just like on and off, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and you do that and transition the car so that the right front tire turns uh, just ahead of, just in front of that corner of the grass. Mm -hmm. So keep in mind, I'm not initiating at the corner of the grass. I'm initiating just before that, but my tire where if I didn't initiate, I'd drive straight onto the grass, right? So mm -hmm. I'm initiating just before that, so my tire uh, goes just in front of that corner. And that's that's my turn in reference. Okay, I can't see anything past that. We're, we're kind of climbing and we're gonna, it's a, it's a slight uh, crest, but um, but you can't see, you're unsighted through the turn. So um, that really is the turn in reference is uh, the corner of the grass there. Kind of a, you know, anytime your turn in reference is that close as well, and you mentioned it earlier, but it's that peripheral, uh, right where it's your your focus vision has already transitioned to look through the apex even though it's unsighted and you're using those peripherals because you want to see what's over the side over that hill as soon as possible mm -hmm. right you're not looking and going there's the grass and that you right. wouldn't have the time to react to that anyway from, from here i can right i can i can line myself right. up from here but once i get to it yeah of course it's all done yeah. but you can see how close the the mirror is to the wall Mm -hmm. um, and oh, yeah. again, I'm not looking at the wall. Like I remember when I was still carrying, you know, uh, passengers back in like instructing your HPD days, you know, I'd still be doing this and people would, would kind of go <gasps> right as they, right as we were at this point. Yeah. And I'd be like, what's wrong? Yeah. You know, Cause I have no, I, I don't, I'm not looking at it. They're looking at it. Yeah. yeah Cause they're right there. They're closer to it. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good indication that you put the car in the right place. Yeah, yeah, and but I'm not nervous about it because I'm I'm not looking at the wall and you know per se. So anyway, as we go ahead, um, yeah, the, the tire will transition just ahead of the grass. And you see, I'm already turning, right? Mm -hmm. But you can see the corner of the grass right there by the N in my name, right mm -hmm. there. Yep. Yep. Right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the the right front tire is going to run past that, and yep. now we're now I'm lined up to come to the um, the apex. But let me refresh. Um, everybody from the beginning of this video, we were talking about turn one, and I said that was very similar to turn 14. This is what I'm talking about. Long, slow hands. I'm gonna continue feeding all the way to the apex. It was a light brake pressure, a light momentary brake pressure. And this is not a trail braking corner where, you break, where you're trailing all the way to the, um, uh, to the apex curb, okay? Um, you are trailing maybe a quarter of the way in just to get the car moving and then and then you're released to keep the car balanced because it's such a high speed turn. But also both of these turns 
have dips halfway between turn in and apex that you need to ride out. So be aware that that just ahead of us, we're, you can't really see it here, but um, there's gonna be a little bit of a dip. And then um, we're, we're aiming for the beginning of the apex curbing. We want to uh, eclipse that curb, the front edge of that curb with only half of our left front tire. Mm -hmm. So it's the very first block right there, okay? But only half of the left front tire. If you don't get there, you're gonna be wide. If, you, if your entire tire hits the front of the curb, you're gonna bounce the car because there's a big divot. So mm -hmm. when you get just half of your tire covering that curb, <laughs> That's the magic spot, okay? And then, and then you can commit to power from that point and let the car use all of the track out. All the track. I, I think that's right. really important here because if you just look at an overhead track map here, you might not necessarily drive it that way because you're probably moving already thinking you need to be track left to get set up for the, for the final couple of corners. Yeah, we'll talk about why you don't need to really set up there um, momentarily, but yeah, we'll you know, that. You play go. that to there. Another couple frames forward, and you'll see I get right, basically right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now from that point, I think this is a probably a good point where we can go to the uh, the data. All right. Take another peek at that. We'll go back over to the data, and I was was looking at it when you were talking about your your braking. Um, tendency here and it looks like Mike has the exact same approach. He's at about a negative 0.67 pedal is as, as much deceleration. And then from that point on, he's out of the brake pedal and transitioning back to throttle. Um, might be just a little bit wide of the apex here. This whole line looks a little compressed to me just from just really face value. Um, mm -hmm. But he, he's definitely uh, turning in at almost the exact same point. Right, right in here. Why don't you zoom in to the end of his breaking point? Yeah, can you zoom in a little bit further there? Uh, that's all I got on the yeah, zoom. That's, okay, here. that's about, yeah, the, it's that's gonna get pretty pixelated anyway, I guess. Um, so in a soft car, um, what happens is if you, if you don't do that kind of late hook through 13 that I mentioned, um, you end up pulling away from the red wall just a little bit sooner than um, you otherwise would be able to. So that's what it enables me to do is, is it gives me time to transition away from the left to center and brake and then back to uh, the right side of the car as I turn left. Um, so that's the, that's the importance of it. Um, but yeah, his approach looks pretty good. He might, he might've turned in just a hair, a hair late. And you know, that approach that I just mentioned might help him a little bit there um, to get, uh, to get the car settled and turned back to the left and hit the, uh, the leading edge of that red, curb with uh, half his left front tire. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm looking here on the speed trace where right, right here is where the blue dot is currently. And you can see the speed trace is really interesting. See how it, it is a swift, you know, quick deceleration and then a really, really slow deceleration to the minimum speed. Um, mm -hmm. So he's, he's rolling in speed and he's not picking up the throttle heartily again or accelerating until after the curbing on the left side. Yeah, you know that would support the theory of a late turn in. Um, that he was, you know, continuing to scrub on the way through the turn rather mm -hmm. than getting back to power. He, he realized he was a little bit late in this particular lap. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what we're probably seeing. I think the GPS is likely showing us that you know what he truly did yeah. um, on this lap. Um, so yeah, I mean, my approach speed is very similar, eighty-eight and a half. Um, my min speed is. Um, 76.8, about 77, 76.8, yeah. Um, so, and that's right at the, you know, same point basically at that, at that apex, um, at the beginning of the apex curbing, and mm -hmm. then you're um, increasing from there. Yeah, it, and his, his minimum speed is about 75, uh, but it occurs a little later than yours in the corner. Um, which is which is interesting, but to me, this just looking at the speed trace, um, it definitely looks like he's trailing the brake into the corner, maybe a little too much. And I would I would be, if I was working with him specifically on this, that, was, that would be a question that I would ask: is, is are we releasing the brake pedal, or is that just the scrub of the steering that's slowing the car down? Basically, we want yeah. to see if he could commit back to power a little bit sooner, right? Yeah. To to me, that tra that trajectory and the sudden change 
from the braking trajectory to the, to me, it looks like a scrub trajectory of the, of the deceleration. Um, but, but he could have been trailing some there. Um, yeah, this is all lining up to me to, to say that he, he had, uh, carried it either carried in a little bit too much or, or turned in just a hair late and then knew he couldn't get back to the apex. He was scrubbing on the way in and then had to wait a little bit longer to get on the throttle for his exit. Yeah. Yeah, the the power of uh, of looking at data. But what I always find interesting about data is, no matter how objectively you look at it, the implementation of what you learn is then goes back to being an art, right? Which is I think what's so interesting about it is it's so scientific, and then you have yeah. to implement it, and it's it's uh, a little bit more challenging. So yeah, um, that's that's awesome information here. I especially liked your approach on entry here. I learned a lot here, and then that half a tire tip right here you know, right where the blue dot is now is, uh, is huge. Um, those, those little subtle nuances are how you find these tents hidden around the track that add up to a lot. Yeah. I'm kind of giving you the home track, uh, you know, advantage here, but that's, that's what we're here to do. So <laughs> that's, that's right. I, I've, uh, I've got a couple of those kind of things that I, that I'd like to talk about at the tracks that I frequent as well. As yeah. <laughs> um, so now as we look at, at the keyhole, um, Again, this turn is very similar, or sorry, I just said keyhole. Uh, this is the carousel, very similar to the keyhole mm -hmm. uh, in that it's a double apex. Um, both of these turns require a fair bit of, um, of patience to get to getting back on the throttle. Um, but being that it's a double apex, these long duration corners, um, I mentioned it before, you approach it as a double apex to carry more speed on the entry and minimize the amount of time that you spend at minimum speed. So that is why we are not setting up track left on the approach here. Mm. So we're, we're, we're maximizing our speed out of 14, out of that fast left, all the way out to the yellow curb. And then, um, yep, and then pulling away, similar to how we did approaching the, um, the uh, madness, where with, with any residual grip, we'll pull back to the left a bit. And you can see that, you can see the GPS trajectory perfectly. Um, so right where that little white car is on this, when this particular uh, <laughs> thing, this photo was taken, um, right at that position, you know, you're, you're turning left, just hold the steering wheel left for a little bit longer and pull it away from the left, from the right side of the track, just a little bit. And then as he gets just past that curb, he's going to straighten up and brake. Now it's very important to note that um, that here kind of right in the middle of the section that we're looking at, there's a significant crest. You're breaking, you're breaking uphill, but then it drops into the carousel. Mm -hmm. So, um, there's a little green spot. Uh, don't move the photo, but just with your arrow, there's a little green spot as you go up ahead under where it says position color, but yeah, right there, mm -hmm. right around that time that that's where his first apex is. You can kind of see he's, He's turned in before that. That's the point where it comes again closest to the inside of the track. And then it will start moving yeah. away again, right? right so yeah, there's not a curve there. That apex, that apex point is there, but it actually is, is a couple, it might be a couple feet into the track, in the, in the track surface. Mm -hmm. okay? Not every apex needs to be off in the grass or on a curb. <laughs> so you can see that's where he kind of uh, is, comes closest to the track and then comes back out to about, he stays a little bit, he stays a little tighter than maybe I do, but, um, uh, but then he comes out to maybe putting his left side tires as at mid track. Yeah, I guess that would be about the same. Yeah. Um, you can see the dark patches. So I'll, so the dark patches, yep. Um, right at the left edge of that dark patch is, is, yeah, right about there is like the center of the track. There's actually a seam in the track surface. You don't want to get further left than that. Okay, but that's about that's about um, where you let the car track out to is about mid about right there. About, uh, mid track. Yeah, and there's a there's a patch before it as well. Um, but both of those uh, left side of the dark patch is about as far as as far left as you want to get to your left side tires. Mm. Okay. And um, so I mentioned the hill, the crest on the way in. So you need to do like 95% of your braking up that crest. As you come over, um, you're going you're, you're gonna to be trying to kind of start to turn the car in um, and you're going to lose almost all your braking capabilities as you come over that crest. And then you're going to compress as you, as you come in 
and you can do just a little bit more that last 5% of braking just as you compress and start coming into that turn. And that last little bit of braking also helps uh, turn the car. It's not, it's not a 10 pedal. It's like maybe a six pedal. Let me see what, what I'm using there. Um, so I'm initially braking at a, a, as much as a 0.8 and I'm coming off, not fully off, but I'm coming down to about a 0 0.3, 0 0.37 mm -hmm. and then adding again to a 0.5 and then, and then completing and then finishing my release as I, as I continue to turn in mm -hmm. to the, the corner. So there's a, there's a, a harder, a harder application as you're coming up the hill uh, releasing most of it, at least half of it, as you come over the crest, and then digging just a little bit more as you as you uh, as you settle the car to to turn it in to the um, kind of as you come into the into the corner. And I'll talk about reference points as we go to video. Super similar with what we're seeing in Mike's data here. He's seeing almost the same exact initial peaks, so about point negative seven eight point eight negative G, and then starts to release the brake pedal, evidenced by this transition back to kind of negative one or so. So that's that release. And then a little bit of a break, you know, back into the pedal, not quite as conservative as you were here, um, but very similar cadence to how he's, you know, applying uh, the brakes here as well. Um, that's awesome. You, do you want to go back to video? Um, yeah, I guess we'll just talk about the apex point real quick mm -hmm. um, because we're going to get there real quick. But now once you get mid corner, um, you're setting up for for your track exit and your, or your corner exit and your run down the front straight, basically, um, because you should be able to stay flat through the next turn. So, um, so again, similar to the keyhole, you're going to have probably a, a, a short section of, of maintenance throttle. If we carry good entry speed, this should be a very short section of maintenance throttle. But then you're going to use a lift, get the car to turn, get it aimed to the, uh, the red and white curving, get it aimed to that apex curving. Uh, that's going to be your second apex, your late apex. And uh, once you get turned in there, you should be able to start committing to throttle. Um, and again, you're, you're using that lift and turn to condense some of your rotation so you can straighten up the exit, which allows you to get to throttle sooner. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it frees up a little bit of steering for, um, for acceleration or a little bit of grip from steering for acceleration. Um, but <clears throat> there is a famous uh, bump right there past the apex. And uh, we'll talk about that in the, as we come through the video. Awesome. And um, on the approach, I'm going to have you uh, pause it um, just as we're kind of coming up the hill. All right. Now, because I'll, I'll draw your attention to it already. You see the bleachers ahead? Yes. Yeah, two sets of bleachers there, and then there will be another couple uh, sets to the further to the right. But um, right yeah, here. but the one to the right of those two, yeah, that one, that's going to be our uh, visual marker as we line ourselves up coming over that crest. Mm. Awesome. All right. So we're with any residual grip, we're gonna we're gonna pull the car back left just a little bit before transition, turning it back to the right, and then we'll break up the hill. So we're breaking. Yeah. Break up the hill here, and uh, let's, sorry, let's go back and kind of. I'm seeing a kind of a jumpy screen. I hope everybody else is seeing a smoother <laughs> screen. But here, um, as we step forward another couple of uh, frames, we'll we'll start lining ourselves up. Over the over the crest, right about here, I'm more or less aiming for that um, that set, that set of bleachers. Um, now we're coming down the hill, so I'm kind of at light brake pressure, but now feeding it back in here. This car is going to kind of block us visually a little bit, but we're on a dark patch here, about half track left side tires at mid track at the most. Uh, continuing forward, uh, lift and get the car turned in. And then into the red and white curbing uh, right there and stay tight to it. And then we're going to be full throttle from there all the way through the next turn. And just pretend the next that car in front of us isn't there. Okay. 
All right. So why don't you just play through that one more time at speed and I won't voice over this time. Okay, through 14. Break up the hill, release another little dig, turn it in, lift, get in there, back on the power, full throttle from here, through the left-hander, onto the front straight. Okay. Um, now let's talk about a little bit more detail. Um, so let's go right back, right before the apex in, uh, yeah, let's step forward just a little bit. We'll go to the bump, or at least where we can see the bump. Okay, we're coming in tighter, tighter, tighter. And right about here, we'll get onto the curb. Now just ahead of where this PTE car is, um, about maybe just about a car length ahead of them is where the bump is. Um, right up here. Yeah, right there. You, you can kind of see it. Um, I will say that the tighter you are to the right, the less impactful it is. A Spec E30 can, can typically hit it, stay full throttle, you know, kind of open the steering a little bit and just ride it out. Um, I was just there a couple uh, weekends ago when uh, Trans Am was there and watching those cars through there, go through there, um, they really cannot get to, to the throttle until after that curb. Mm -hmm. Now I could definitely see which drivers were the NASCAR drivers driving in TA2 uh, getting ready for their Xfinity race because they were all, you know, pedal to the metal, just ride it out, big sideways, you know, they're, they're just throwing everything at it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's kind of that, that driving style, but, um, but the guys that, that know the cars and, and knew the track, um, you know, it was, it was very evident that you really can't apply power. And, and I'll, I'll say this for, for, uh, you know, higher horsepower cars, you may be feeding in, but you're really not going to be able to commit to full throttle, um, until you get through that, um, you know, if you're over a certain power threshold. So keep that in mind based on where your car, uh, where your car is staying a little bit tighter, uh, knowing that, that that bump is there, just opening up your hands a little bit, um, and, uh, riding that out and trying to stay, trying to put down as much throttle as you can, as you come through there as possible. Now, very similar to turn nine before we went under the Honda, the Honda bridge, mm -hmm. I mentioned you track out as much as you can with as much speed as possible where the limiting factor to how much you track out and how early you get back on the throttle, the limiting factor is, can you stay flat through 16 or the left, that left hander onto the front straight. So in a Spec E30, you can basically track out almost all the way to the left and then just hook it back to the, the left and, and you'll make it through there um, without having to lift. Spec Miata, pretty similar. Um, but in a higher horsepower car, you may need to compromise to stay a little bit tighter coming through here, maybe mid-track, so when you get turned back to the left, you can stay full throttle and get a, get a nice fast run onto the front straight. All right, so here you're very much so, you know, mid-track or, or a little further track left, and in a higher horsepower car, you're, you're gonna wanna stay further to your right here. Yep, and then take a wider arc, a wider radius yep. through uh, 16. You know, on, on the bump, something that you mentioned, this bump that we were looking at, I, I raced a, um, a late model stock car with a, uh, with a, a solid rear axle and a NASCAR style, you know, transmission and, and same driveline. And what's interesting about those cars is they respond really well because of the solid rear axle to a dramatic lift of the throttle right over a bump. Weirdest thing I've ever experienced in a race car, but if anybody out there that's valuable to you, Tommy Riggins, who raced those stock cars forever, he ran Trans Am and um, IMSA, you know, Kelly American Challenge, stuff that had that kind of car in it. And there's a there's a bump similar to this, a little bit higher speed at Road Atlanta. Um, but you actually chop the throttle on those big truck style cars with four nine inches and stuff, and it makes it feel smooth. It's huh. the oddest thing I've ever experienced, but um, you know, try that one on your own legal, uh, you know, there, there's no legal advice here. There's no implications of, um, you're going to be fine if that happens. I don't know. Uh, it's at your own risk, but it helped me a lot. Um, yeah. it probably doesn't apply to most cars with limited slip differentials and independent suspension. If you have the car aimed right and in the right place, you can probably ride it out. Um, but those cars that have the, the kind of primitive differentials and whatever happens on the left side of the rear axle happens on the right side, for whatever reason that helps. Mm -hmm. Weird. Interesting. 
<laughs> <laughs> something you know from my past that I got to got to dig up there. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Well, this is obviously another very important turn for this track because it leads on to the second longest straightaway on the on the front straight here, and um, that you know completes the lap of Mid Ohio. That's it. And, well, um, as a reminder, this is what's referred to as the pro course. Um, so. Uh, whereas the club course uh, runs a chicane between turn one and the keyhole, and that's where the numbering nomenclature that I'm using is coming from, mm -hmm. um, is uh, you know, that full track with all those turns. But um, if anybody wants uh, to see this video and be able to play, you know, play through it on their own, uh, it's on my, it's on the Drive Faster Now YouTube page. Uh, you can go in there and just use the search function in that page. Um, to you know, search uh, Mid Ohio track record or Mid Ohio Spanky Thirty, um, it should it should come up. Uh, there's some other Mid Ohio videos in there, uh, including wet videos, which <laughs> uh, is very different uh, around Mid Ohio. Um, yeah, awesome. It's, yeah, uh, that's what I've heard. It's a whole other animal, and it's basically everything's the opposite of what we talked about. You spend as little time on the dry line as possible. All the sealer is uh, kryptonite. And <laughs> you do all your turning off of it and your accelerating is uh, breaking off of it. Um, and that's kind of survival of uh, mid Ohio in the wet. Yeah. Uh, but you can, they can, people can uh, check out the video um, that I have for, for wet laps around here. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for adding all that context because uh, I, I hope, you know, folks out there who are apex pro users and you're looking to set some, you know, goals for yourself using your data, having this kind of, um, you know, interaction and intimate, uh, knowledge really, um, really, really comes into play because at the end of the day, your data is, is your tool and you really have to add all of these pieces of knowledge that we're talking about. And a lot of it comes from a track walk or driving it in a different car or riding with somebody. There's all this, this data that's been assimilated. Um, and a big thing that I think that Anthony hit on that's really important, no matter what data system you're using, of course, I prefer it to be an Apex Pro, pretty biased, but um, it's about priority, right? Like we talked about, and you, you made a really, really important point that um, uh, Mid-Ohio is a really tricky track because you have to learn how to prioritize the right things, which is true with every track, but more so when all of the corners lead into another corner. Um, mm -hmm. So we tried to, and I tried to focus on in the data when we reviewed this on specifically stuff that you can look at in your own data and go, does mine look like that? You know, we saw this, this line right here, this, uh, you know, the speed trace where Mike was scrubbing speed going into, um, you know, turn 14 after the, the red wall on the left. And you could tell that he was struggling. He had charged the corner a little too much and wasn't able to get back to power soon enough. And stuff like that that you can actually find in your speed trace or in your GPS overlay that without having to do a ton of digging, I think is really, really, really powerful. Um, and then hopefully you can take some of the more specific tools that we talked about here and kind of, um, you know, use them for references. But, um, yeah, how, how can people follow you, Anthony, if they want to, um, you know, either get in touch with you or see what you've got going on? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm in, on Facebook um, as myself. I tend to only, you know, accept friend requests of people that I've actually met in real life. But um, <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my page is Drive Faster Now on Facebook, drivefasternow.com. Um, and then I'm racing this year, uh, for 5.2 motorsports, um, and their Facebook page is also 5.2 motorsports. Uh, we're running, um, an ST2, uh, Shelby GT350 Mustang in, uh, NASA Super Touring 2. Um, so we'll be at Mid-Ohio this weekend, uh, with NASA Great Lakes, and then we'll be at the championships, uh, next month in September. Um. We're seeing what we can do there. Yeah. Uh, so I also have some uh, video from a, a quicker car like that that's running, um, you know, a 130-ish type of lap time um, versus this uh, 143. So if somebody's looking for some reference from something a little bit quicker, um, they can find that there. Um, as I mentioned, I do you know, a lot of driver coaching. So if you kind of want this pr whole process to go uh, a bunch quicker, you know, I'm, I'm available for that. Awesome. Yeah, I would, I would uh, recommend it. If you want to take this amount of track knowledge and then put it in that visceral, you know, real life um, situation at the track, I can only imagine help people find a lot of speed here. So yeah, well, based I, I on would, your data and your video it certainly helps. <laughs> a, absolutely. It, it helps a lot. You got to, got to have all the tools, but thanks for taking your time to do this and um, we'll hopefully do more in the future. Sounds good.
Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. All right. We'll do it right. again soon. All right. Take care.